So um, I've been looking at consumer technology for, for many years, many longer than 13. And um, in Silicon Valley, it is a mark of honor to show up and say that you have worked at a failed startup. Because failure supposedly teaches you much more than success. You learn from your mistakes, you've been through it, you understand. Which makes me wonder then how it is possible that so many consumer tech products are still coming out that are horrible. Um, let's see, is this right? Yeah, so this first came up in the late 80s. I was writing for Macworld Magazine. And then PowerBooks, the, the, the Mac laptops, did not have a video output. I couldn't project to a projector like I'm doing right now for my laptop. There was no way to connect a projector. So this little company came up with a, a, a daughter board, a little circuit board. You could open up your PowerBook and install this daughter board. And it would give you a video output jack so you could project a, a connect a projector. It was a big deal. So I reviewed it using my own laptop. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, that's what happened. <laughs> I turned it on, thick black smoke coming up from the keyboard. It was, I was like, what? <laughs> um, and I called the company, and then the guy said, oh, you must have done it wrong. That never happens. We don't understand. So I wrote up what happened. I wrote the review that said, you know, I wouldn't buy this thing because that's what it did. And the company was livid, and they bought a full page ad in the magazine to rebut my review. And they dragged me through the mud and said, this guy's an idiot, he doesn't know what he's doing. And so it was painful all around, although the magazine enjoyed the full page ad. Um, so the punchline is coming up later. Uh, so in my time reviewing products, I have learned that when a product is a failure, it's really only slightly because of the product. It's mostly because of the policies or the people who are running the thing. Remember this, the Microsoft Spot Watch? No. That, that's a joke. It didn't really display the blue screen of death. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it looked like this. And it was actually very cool. It, it was the first smartwatch. It, got your, uh, it, it, it connected to the internet via the FM radio band, which is very clever. So it showed you your text messages and your, your email and the weather and sports and so on. Um, and it failed. And it's, it's obviously very beautiful. It was very easy to use. So why did it fail? Well, it failed because, first of all, it required a subscription, $10 a month for a watch. <laughs> it also had some, some, the FM radio technology had some drawbacks to it. For example, the watch stopped working if you left your area code. <laughs> I really think this through. <laughs> that kind of died. I love this when people say, what's the worst product you ever reviewed? This was it. It was the Akimbo box, way ahead of its time, 2005. The idea was basically what we know now as Netflix. So you would have uh, this box would connect to the internet and give you on demand any TV show you want at any time, which is just a giddy, crazy thing. So the only things wrong with it were, number one, the box cost $300. There was a monthly fee, $20 a month, and you paid by the show. $3 or $5 per show, and it expired after 24 hours. But that wasn't the big problem. The big problem was the TV industry had just seen what happened to the music industry, and they were terrified. They weren't ever going to put their shows on the internet and get burned by pirates. So they would not play ball to give rights to the akimbo people. So they got together what they could, but I'm, I'm not kidding you, your selection was like, Turkish sitcoms, <laughs> they're like ads from British television, movie trailers, that was it. Why? Was there nobody at the company who could see that this was a ridiculous project, who could have pulled the stop chain? So I'm going to boil this down for you into the seven reasons products fail. May you apply these lessons to your own industry. First of all, um, I call this the upgrade paradox, and this is that if you improve a product enough times, you eventually ruin it. Yeah. This is the way the technology industry works. When you buy a piece of software, Photoshop or whatever, it's not like buying a vase or a mirror. You, you've just basically joined a club, and you will be asked to renew your dues every single year forever for another hundred bucks for the next version. And how do they entice you to buy the next version? They add on features. They pile on new functions, eventually functions that nobody asked for. 
Microsoft Word, you're too young to remember, used to be a word processor. Now it's a web design program and a database and a floor wax. It's out of control. <laughs> Nobody can use Microsoft Word. We, we have this problem, right? Technology accelerates. It used to be that a new format would only come along once every thousand years. And then every 500 years, then every... Now, we're adopting new formats and retiring them every year. I mean, they're, you know, you think flash drives are still going to be around in five years? No, they're coming and going. CDs are already gone. Um, the second factor is uh, the pressure to ship things. This one really blows my mind. It turns out the way you would think a product would be invented is you come up with an idea, you work on it until it's good, then you sell it. That isn't how the industry works. What they do is they sit down with the accountants, they figure out when they're going to need a burst of money, that's going to be August 2015, and they work backwards from that. Okay, we're going to ship this thing August 2015 because it'll be just in time for the holiday season. If it's not ready, too bad. They ship it anyway. I love this story. Um, this was the Blackberry Storm. You wonder why the Blackberry is dead. Um, this was a, the first touch screen Blackberry. And it was, it was uh, released to the public right at the holiday season, 2008, and it was clearly not ready. Um, let's see if we can get this to play. Okay, here we are in the calendar. You can see that my finger is right on the time. We're going to push. No, look at that. Look at that. My finger is nowhere near the thing that was highlighted. I want this thing above it. Push, click, 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 click. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Okay, now I got it. There's three o'clock. I'd like to change that, but nothing's happening. I clicked fully. Nothing's okay. There we go. There's three o'clock. I'd like to change it to four o'clock. Look at that. I'm on the three. You can see that I'm on the three. You can see it. But the 45 got highlighted. So now I have to go back up to zero for that and try again. There we go. Now it went down to two, even though I didn't push any arrows yet. So I'm going to push up arrow, and there it is, four o'clock. And then this is a crazy one. I was addressing an email. <laughs> I'll just show you. I was addressing an email where in the middle, well, you'll see. Okay, so I was entering a Gmail address, and now the camera came on. The keyboard remains on the screen, so there's the viewfinder, and yet the keyboard is... Alright, now the whole thing is turned off. I can't exit. I can't back out. The power button doesn't do anything. The camera button, the escape button, the menu button, none of the, the buttons are still lit up, but none of them does anything. It is completely locked up. And this is not the first time. <laughs> See how they're still lit up? The thing is on, and yet it's completely dead. Doesn't click. No button. Still on. The only way out of this, I know from experience, is to take off the battery. <laughs> So, you might wonder, why did I video this at all? It wasn't because I knew about this talk in 2014. Um, it was because when I called BlackBerry to report this, they said, you're wrong. You're crazy. This product is ready for prime time. We believe in quality assurance, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, it's doing this stuff. And they're like, sorry, we don't, no, we, we, it's fine. And so the reason I was calling is I said, you know, I'm having all these problems with it. I'm giving you the opportunity here to tell me that, oh yes, we plan to release an update that will fix the problems. But they wouldn't. They were, they were just like, quiet on the phone, they're like, Blackberry stands for quality insurance. They're like, dude! <laughs> and I sent them these videos, and then I called them back, and this is the funniest thing ever, they're in Toronto. And so they were on their a conference call, it was their you know, marketing person, product lead, and you know PR person. I'm like, so did you watch the videos? They're like, we watch the videos, and I'm like, well, doesn't it look like something's wrong? It's just classic. They're Canadian. Um, <laughs> they, they didn't know what to say because they couldn't admit that it was screwed up, so they just said nothing. There was silence on the phone. I'm like, hello? Did you get the vi It was weird. They must have all just been like... <laughs> 
So I published a review, and it was scathing, and um, and yet I got this email afterwards. David, I work at RIM on the Storm team, although the company will keep me confidential. Doesn't surprise me you found so many problems. When you wrote the product was released prematurely, you were absolutely right, and everyone here knew it. You were under tremendous pressure from Verizon to deliver the unit for the start of the holiday season. Internally, some of us argued that we'd be hurting ourselves by rushing out the door. Obviously, our managers disagree. This goes on! What the hell? Third factor is fix it later, the fix it later syndrome. It came as a stunning shock to me when I learned that people ship these products knowing that there's problems with them and intending that they will simply fix them later. So, um, for example, um, this is the first Barnes and Noble Nook. The screen is balky, it's non responsive. Uh, it takes three seconds to turn a page, which is really disruptive if you're mid sentence. This is my review. So yes, it's a mess, clearly rushed out the door. So I asked them for a comment. They said, yes, we want to optimize everything quite a bit. <laughs> this is after you shipped it! What about optimizing it before we guinea pigs buy your poor products? <laughs> um, this is a product called the U-Star. It was a home green screen kit that let you put yourself into classic movie scenes. It crashes constantly. This is my review. It crashes constantly. The scroll bars don't work. Sometimes no audio gets connected. Sometimes the camera shows only a still frame, it has to be unplugged. Blah, 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 blah. The company acknowledges the bugs, calls it the usual 1.0 bumpy road, and says that bug fix patches are coming soon. Guys, you only get one chance for a first impression. You've never heard that? You don't, you don't go on a blind date unshaven and smelly saying, well, I can always take a shower later. <laughs> got fired over this principle. So this, this was my editor at the New York Times, David Darling. And one time I wrote a review and I filed it. I'm supposed to file on Tuesday for my Thursday column. I sent it in, all was well, and he writes back, David, the Asian edition of the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, it goes to press earlier than we do because of the time zone. They need your column. Can you please turn it in? I'm like, I turned it in. And he said, well, why don't you send it again? Because they're frantic. So I sent it again. Next morning, <clears throat> David, this is unacceptable. They're about to publish a big blank column. You need to turn that in. I'm like, I turned it in twice. Here it is again. I had no idea what was going on. Finally, in the emergency, I, um, I went to Gmail. I sent it to him. All was well. But I later did a deconstruction and figured out the problem. So you can have multiple emails for somebody, um, as Damon has. The one in bold is the default address. That's the one he uses all the time. The one underneath it is an alternate address. That I had just started using a new version of Outlook for the Mac. A new version. <laughs> <laughs> and it so happens that I had, of course, set his Times address as the default email. And yet, and yet, when you start to address an email, Autocomplete in this version fills in the wrong email address, not the one that's in bold. It fills in the alternate as the default proposed autocomplete. So time after time, I was turning in my column to an email address he hasn't checked since the Reagan administration. <laughs> so I wrote this up. And guys, when I write this stuff up, the companies are furious. The PR people are hysterical, like, did you have to embarrass us like that? You know, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> these guys actually met with me. They flew to Stanford and the Microsoft team and sat down with me and explained to me. They schooled me. They said, you really obviously don't know how the software industry works. <laughs> there is not a single bug-free program on Earth. Every program has bugs, and they are known bugs. They know about it. They have a list internally. They know what bugs are there when they ship it. They ship a known faulty product, OK? But eventually, they could spend the rest of their lives fixing bugs. So eventually, they draw a line and say, that's all we're going to fix before we ship this thing. And if you will look, yeah. 
that was the next bug they would have fixed. They had to draw the line somewhere. And I nearly lost my job over it. Another big problem is many of these products had too many cooks. So Steve Jobs is famous. He didn't have uh, focus groups. He didn't do beta testing programs. He accepted no input from anybody but his own brain. And his products were spectacularly, singularly focused and dedicated to being what he imagined them to be. The entire corporation of Apple grew up for no other person, purpose than to serve this guy's brain. So it was like, this is my elf workshop, and all the ideas come from here. Uh, James Cameron is famous for having the like number one, two, and three best-selling movies of all time, and is also ridiculed for being a megalomaniac. He has no co-authors, he writes his own script, he films his own video movies, he edits them himself, he does everything. He is a control freak, megalomaniac, and every one of his movies comes out to be the spectacular, spectacular mega hit. Microsoft, on the other hand, is famous for its endless focus groups. They put people behind one-way one mirrors, and they have them try out the beta software, see how they like it. Um, and so what do we get? We get Windows Vista. Uh, so having extensive focus grouping is no guarantee for a good product. We have Windows 8. They put 1,500 1, hours of user testing beside, behind Windows 8 which is such a disaster that PC sales are crashing 15% a year because of it. Um, so, as you may know, I started this new website in January called Yahoo Tech. It's yahootech.com. You should check it out. It's, it's a gem. It's a under, over, overlooked gem. And one of the things that I do there... <laughs> no, no, we actually just had our first 3 million reader day last week, so we are, we are doing okay. Um, but you still should check it out. Um, the... Um, the, the cool thing that I'm doing for Yahoo Tech is I'm reviewing products that are Kickstarter projects. Ah. Kickstarter is this amazing website where some inventor or playwright or filmmaker with a great idea puts up a video describing his vision and appeals to the public for funding. And you kick in 25 bucks or 40 bucks, not because you're going to get a, a, a return on your investment. You won't. It's just to participate. It's just to to sponsor a great idea with a great vision. And what's amazing is some of these things go on to become real products. This, this was the world's first perpetual razor. Um, every time you finish shaving, you put the razor back on the stand, and sharpeners inside resharpen the blade. So it's a five-year stainless steel blade that you, you, you don't fill the landfill with cartridges. Um, it costs $600, so it flopped. But um, <laughs> what a cool idea. Um, this is a Bluetooth earpiece for your phone that also happens to have an infrared camera on the tip that monitors the rate and angle of your eye blinks and knows when you're falling asleep. So if you start to nod off behind the wheel, it can sound an alarm, play some music, ring your phone, whatever you want. Um, such a great idea. This is a pair of headphones called the Aviga Glyph. Excellent noise canceling headphones with the simple twist that if you flip the things down like this, it becomes a giant screen TV floating seven feet in front of you. Such a good idea. So many of these things are very successful and very unusual, and they make it to market and become hits, the Pebble Watch, you know. Um, and the reason they make it to market is because there aren't too many cooks. It's because it's one guy with a vision. And it, sorry, they're always guys, these, these guys. Um, and they, they remain true to their vision. It's not diluted by lawyers and marketing people and accountants. It's one person who's desperate to make his product come true. So it tends to be great. Um, that's why I love Kickstarter so much. There's a fifth factor at work, the way we've always done things syndrome. Um, it drives me crazy the way uh, the technology industry uses the language. Um, they use these terms, content, when they mean websites. You know, refresh your content. Who talks like that? <laughs> they say dialogue when they mean dial box, dial box they mean display um, when they mean a non transitive verb. So they'll say something like um, the software, um, um, let's see, well, they, they use it wrong. <laughs> I can't think of it. Uh, DRM when they mean copy protection, enable when they mean turn on, functionality when they mean feature, LCD when they mean screen. PDA, when they, well, I guess that still means public disclosure. Um, price point, when they mean price, URL, when they mean web address, SMS, when they mean text message, 
support when they mean works with, like this screen supports VGA. No, it works with VGA. So nobody talks to themselves like that. Nobody. Oh, and the, the big one, of course, is user. There are only two industries that refer to their customers. <laughs> 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 if you think about it. <laughs> so I got an interesting call from Samsung three years ago. Uh, I had just made fun of their user guides in my column, and there was a bad translation from Korean. Um, and uh, they, their head of their, um, uh, of their documentation division, their manuals division, called me and said, we would like to hire you as a consultant to help us fix our manuals because we're constantly made fun of and we're obviously not doing the customer any good because they call our tech support and that costs us money. So can we make the manuals better from the beginning? And I said, well, I, you can't hire me because I can't accept money from companies I review. But why not? If you feel like coming to Westport, Connecticut, um, I will be happy to give you a free consultation. So, six people. <laughs> flew to Westport and met in my little attic apartment. Only one of them spoke English. They set up a camcorder, they filmed the whole thing, they were furiously taking notes. And I said, why don't you first explain to me how your manuals come into existence now? This is what they told me. This will blow your little minds. OK. <laughs> right now, the engineers write the first draft of the manual. Oh my God. Yeah, there's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Samsung makes washing machines and microwave ovens. When has an engineer ever used a washing machine <laughs> or a microwave? These are not the target audience, people. So, I have a great joke. What's the difference between an introverted engineer and an extroverted engineer? The introverted engineer looks at his shoes when he's talking to you. The extroverted engineer looks at your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that. Okay. So anyway, so the engineers write the first draft of the manual in Korean. The manuals are then shipped to London where a translation company, never having seen the product, rewrites it in English, ships it back to Seoul, where they are proofread and packaged, shipped to America, where we open them and throw them into the ocean. <laughs> They're completely useless. That is just idiotic. And I said, guys, 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 why don't you just get an American writer from the beginning to write the manual? And they said, oh, there is no time. We are we are busy, you know, we want the product to come out at the same time as the, all my, all my accents sound Indian, I don't know why. Um, they, they said they want the product to come out at the same time as the manual, they can't have the product developed and then wait six weeks for the manual to be done. So I said, okay, fine, hire an American to come and live in Seoul for the summer, to work side by side with your engineers so the manual is done at the same time as the product. And do you know what? They did that! <laughs> like a year later, I get this shipping crate from Korea with all these stickers all over it with manuals for phones and shower heads and TVs and microwaves and software and cameras, all of these uh, Korean you know, Samsung products that have been written using the new code method. <laughs> 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 I joined the conversation. <laughs> so, anyway. There's another factor at work here, um, and that is um, what I call the Broadway flop effect. I spent 10 years conducting Broadway shows. Out of college, my first job, I was a musician. I was a pit musician and a conductor and an arranger. So uh, is it, everyone says, well, what shows did you work on? And it's, it's a tough question for me because I worked exclusively on flops. <laughs> um, I, I like to think it's not because I worked on them that they were flops, but they were, they were all flops. And, um, and yet, even when we were working on a turkey, nobody ever dared speak those words. Nobody ever said to the director, you know, dude, this show isn't working. Why not? It's the same reason no one of these tech companies never says, guys, this product is terrible. Why not? Because it's your job. It's a paycheck. The longer you can keep showing up at that Broadway theater, the longer you'll get paid. The last thing you're going to do is call out the emperor as having no clothes. You're not going to say, this show is, is terrible. You want everybody to believe so it'll stretch as long as possible and you'll keep getting paid. 
We need something like what the Japanese car assembly lines have. We need every worker on the line to have a red stop handle. Do you know that's how they did it in the 80s? That's how the Japanese cars came to exceed ours in quality. They gave every engineer, every technician, a red stop handle. So if some car is coming along and the screw from the last door handle station is not going in properly and you notice that, you stop the entire production line and everybody gathers around at the screw guy station and they figure out what, that, what was going on. And then they go back. So no little problem ever turns into a bigger problem. That's how they did it. We need that in other realms of life. So I told you there was a punchline to this story. And the punchline is that years later, I ran into this guy, the PR guy for that daughter board company at the Consumer Electronics Show. He's like, oh, David Bogue. And I'm like, oh, Mike Snedders, or whatever you <laughs> And uh, he goes, yeah, I haven't talked to you since that daughter board review. Woo! I'm like, yeah, I know. Remember when you like made me out to be an idiot and took out a full page ad? He goes, oh, well, I mean, you were right. I was like, oh, we all knew it. That thing was like a smoking disaster on wheels. Um, but we had to ship it, right? The deadline was on us, so what could we do? I'm like, but you fought me over the phone! You told me I was nuts, that it was perfect! He goes, dude, I'm a PR guy, what am I going to say? <laughs> what the heck? You can't, you made me believe. So they all knew it. They knew it all the time. The PR guy knew it. They all knew it. And they just run me along, made me feel like the idiot, because it's his paycheck to do so. So there's a bunch of things wrong. The last factor is something that I call the 80% rule, and it's something that allows me to forgive a little bit of the first six factors. Um, every year I go to the Consumer Electronics Show, every year I see what the industry is trying to hawk next, what the next big tech breakthrough is going to be. And for years and years and years, they try to hawk things that are duds from the outset. So for years, it was, it was surf the internet on your TV. How many people here actually surf websites, read websites on your TV? I didn't think so. This is 15 years after they started trying to get us to do that. Nobody wants it! And I could have told you that from the beginning, save your breath. Four years ago, three years ago, it was 3D televisions. They all want us to watch television with 3D glasses on. None of you do that either. I guarantee you, it's a bluff. This year, it's all about curved televisions. They're plugging curved television sets. They argue it is more immersive. You know, you're more in the scene. Well, I got some geometrical news for you. <laughs> if you curve your TV enough to be around you, then the people on either side of you on the couch can't see anything! <laughs> They're looking at the back of the set! It is the stupid... So what they wind up doing is they just curve it a little. <laughs> and it makes no difference at all. Who is going to buy a TV that doesn't sit flat on the wall? It's the dumbest thing. And, you know, the more I look at that picture, I realize who the target market is for these things. It's, <laughs> it's skinny models with no other furniture to lean on. That's what it's for. So, and I just, I was raging in January. I'm like, come on, why? Millions of dollars, marketing, manpower, barking up a tree that anyone could tell you is the wrong tree. And then, it hit me. I started out my career right out of college in New York, not only doing Broadway shows, but on the side, paying house calls to make personal training for computers. I would visit celebrities and teach them how to use their Macs. One of them was this guy, William Goldman. He is the author of many famous books and movies, The Princess Bride, Marathon Man, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And I thought, how cool is this? I get to go to his apartment on Fifth Avenue, and I get to, uh, to meet the great man. So I walk in, and there in his living room is a shelf of the first editions of his books. And there they are, Princess Bride, Marathon Man, Butch Casting the Sundance Kid, and the moving target, the color of light, heat, the silent gondoliers, brothers, <laughs> control, boys and girls together, the temple gold, and your turn to curtsy, my turn to bow. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Goldman, what are, what are those books? He goes, oh, those are my flops. When he's writing a book, he doesn't know if it's the next Princess Bride. 
for all he knew, his big hit was going to be, your turn to curtsy. <laughs> he doesn't know at the time he's writing them any more than those Broadway writers out who were employing me knew whether their show was going to be a hit any more than a movie company puts out a movie knowing if it will hit, no, any more than an electronics company knows if its thing will be a hit. The answer is the 80% rule. 80% of everything is crap. <laughs> but you don't know it until it reaches the marketplace. That is why they keep putting on bad Broadway shows. That is why they keep putting out bad movies and bad books. That is why he, he keeps writing flops. Because 20% of them, or less, will become hits. But you don't know which ones. So all you can do is keep cranking them out and see which ones finally hit. So if you are in the business of creating things, I will beg you to take away these lessons. Simplicity tends to sell. Wait till it's ready. Speak up about the naked emperor. Give everyone that Japanese car line stop button. Let everyone be able to say, wait, 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 guys, this doesn't work. Find a visionary and hand over the wheel. Don't try to do things by committee. And if you are someone who buys this stuff, don't feel like an idiot if you're frustrated by your gadget. It's probably not your fault. <laughs> it's probably the design or the implementation of your gadget. Be aware of good design and bad design. It's all around you. If you hate your phone or hate your TV's menu system, not your problem. It was designed badly. Reward simplicity and excellence by buying it and staying loyal to it. Um, and uh, there's my email address if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you so much.